Bottle can make a difference. By filling your baby bottle with your loose change and dollar bills, you can impact the lives of those of our community who are facing the crisis of unexpected pregnancy. Your baby bottle could literally change or save a life. Anyone can fill a baby bottle. Invite your family, your friends, little ones, teens, neighbors, and coworkers to fill a bottle too. The funds raised will help us as we serve moms, dads, and their babies each day, offering help, support, and the resources they need to make a life-affirming decision. Your change will help us provide pregnancy tests, life-changing counsel, education, baby supplies, and more. Take your bottle home and fill it to the top. When you return your bottle, you are giving the gift of hope. Thank you for making a difference for life. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. I, uh, I've been told for the past five years that, uh, by my wife that I should be celebrating Mother's Day because we have a dog, and I've always refused it. But now, officially, Anna, we can celebrate Mother's Day. Congratulations. Congratulations to all, all the moms out there. Thank you, moms. Thank you very much, moms. That was uh, a video from, from the ministry we support called Options for Women. If you want to know more about that, awesome ministry. They got a table uh, out front in the lobby by the, by the main office if you want to know more about that bottle drive. It's really, really cool ministry. Might notice some other things going on in the uh, lobby right now. We have some cupcakes out there for you moms. Those aren't special communion cups, guys, so I don't want to see, I don't want to see dads walking around with cupcakes, all right? Those are for the moms. Those are for the moms. So we have uh, Aubrey's cupcakes for the moms out there just to say thank you, to say thank you to all the moms and the love that, that you've shown for so many. Uh, also have just an air out there for you guys to be taking family pictures as well. Uh, also really cool this morning we get to do on Mother's Day, we get to do a baby dedication, which is really cool. So uh, parents and babies and children and all of the above, you guys want to come up forward and we can start that. I asked for, asked for uh, or congratulated the people in first service that were able to get all their kids ready for first service. But all these parents, myself included, that can't have their kids ready for first service, we're the ones that really need the prayer, right? So we, we really, really need it. But well, it's cool. We had, uh, we had, who do we got here? I know my kid's getting ready. We're just slow. There we go. Come on up front. Don't be, give him a round of applause. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. It's cool. We have between the two services. Yeah, you guys, come right up front. <laughs> it's still early. That's right. Between the two services, I think we have about 15 kids getting dedicated this morning. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Which goes to show we've been pretty busy as parents over COVID. <laughs> 15 kids. It's really cool. I want to just uh, I'll give you guys a moment. I'm not asking. You guys don't have to share anything. But if you guys want to introduce yourselves uh, so, so the church knows who you are, that'd be great. I guess I'll start off since my wife is right here. I'm but, uh, Anna. This is Landon. I'm Cody. Yes, this is our son Landon. You guys can come up right to the mic, too. Oh, yeah. I won't force my wife to do that. So we're the Giles, I'm Matt, this is Bree, and this is our son Jameson. We're the Brewers, I'm Shane, it's my wife Meg, baby Joey, and Maverick. I'm Michael Raveling, this is Hannah Raveling, this is little baby Madeline. <laughs> so cool. It's so cool. I want to share just a, a quick verse. I know babies get squirmy, so I'll try not to take too long here, but verse uh, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, this is the Apostle Paul t- speaking to the, to the young leader, Timothy. He says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Who Timothy was and the faith life that he had was a direct result of the people that were in his life, his mom and his grandmother. That's so cool. And it was a a great impact that uh, his mom and his grandmother 
had on him. It says that, uh, Paul says it's a genuine, uh, different translation might say, sincere faith that Timothy had, the same spirit that was in his grandmother and his mom. Think about what, what a genuine faith is, right? It's not, uh, uh, genuine faith isn't just, you know, signing on a piece of paper saying that you're a Christian or just showing up to church on Sunday. A genuine faith is, is a faith that's transforming, a faith that, that uh, relies on a living God and his grace and his love for us. And when we're in the presence of that, it just changes who we are. It's genuine. It's real. It's something that is so real. And I'm amazed by that genuine faith that gets passed on. And, and that's what I think I can speak for all of us here. Like, that's the genuine faith that we want to pass down to our kids, uh, not just in this baby dedication, but as a representation of what we want our lives and our legacy to be. We want to pass down a genuine faith. I'm amazed by the, by the legacy that Timothy's mom and grandmother left for him. Word legacy is something that has been in my mind a lot, and maybe some of your lives as well, just as, as new parents, this word legacy. And really simply, it's just what you leave behind that has an impact on others, right? It's your legacy. For better or for worse, it's, it's, it's how we impact other our lives, our, how we choose to live, uh, who we are and who we become. It changes the life of those around us. It changes the life that those come, uh, come after us. I think about, I grew up on a lake and just thinking about all the boats that come out on a small lake. And you just have all these wakes that all end up coming together and, and a once calm lake now has all these ripple effects kind of intermingling with each other. And our lives have a ripple effect, right? The choices that we make, who we are, it impacts the world around us and it impacts people around us as well. It's, it's, the choices that we make, and every single one of us here, every single one of us here have a legacy left to us. Our lives are directly affected by the wake of our parents, for better or for worse, to be fair. We're impacted by the legacy of our parents. I'm so thankful, Mom, wherever you are, I know you're in here somewhere. I'm so thankful for my mom and for the legacy that she continues to leave behind for me and my family, just a legacy of, of faithfulness and love for God. So thankful for that. This verse, it should be an encouragement for, for all moms, for all, everyone out there, that you can be in, encouraged at this text that your life actually, you can have incredible impact on the world around you, and especially your family and your kids. You can have incredible impact. And it's also an incredible challenge that you have the responsibility to have that incredible impact as well. And that's a, that's a scary thing at times. But may that verse be a reminder and an encouragement to us. What's up, bud? What's up? You guys fighting already? Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. But the question, the question for us to ask is, for us as, as parents and all you parents out there, is what legacy am I leaving behind for my kids as a parent, right? What legacy are we leaving behind? And, and, and we're all up here because we're asking that question. What legacy are we going to leave behind for our kids? And also as a church family, like we need to be asking, what legacy as a church are we leaving behind for the next generation? And we begin to answer that question this morning uh, as, as we uh, continue forward and we just have parents come up and say, this is, this is the genuine faith. These, these families want you to know that we want to pass along a genuine faith to our kids. We want you to know that. And we're also going to just take a, a moment for us to pray as a church so that you have an opportunity not just to pray, but to also take on a responsibility to say, as a church community, we're going to take on this responsibility to pass on a genuine faith to this next generation. I encourage you to do that, and we're also going to be giving these uh, children's Bibles as well to all the, all the different families, just as a reminder, God's word is the legacy we're passing on, right? God's word is the legacy we're passing on. It's a reminder of that. Maybe not this translation exactly. It's a good translation, but uh, it might be, have a lot more pictures and words in it. But God's word is the legacy that we're passing on. So we're just going to take a brief time to do that, to pray for these kids, that our lives as families and as a church would show them uh, just the impact of being in the presence of a loving God. So I'm going to share a prayer with you all that I've, I've actually prayed before. It's, it's, uh, it mirrors Paul's prayers to the Ephesians. Uh, that I think is so appropriate uh, as we pray for our kids and as, we, uh, and as you all pray for us as, as family. So if you could please uh, join me with that prayer, that would be wonderful. Heavenly Father, creator of everything in heaven and on earth, I pray that from your glorious, unlimited resources, that you will empower these children 
with your inner strength through your spirit. Then Christ will make his home in their hearts as they trust in him. His roots, their roots will grow down into your love and keep them strong. And may they have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep your love is. May they experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to fully understand. Then they will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from you. Amen. Amen. Give them a round of applause. Thanks for coming up, guys. You guys can be seated. You guys can go down. As we continue our worship this morning, those of you that are here in the sanctuary, I invite you to stand. As we turn to 388, 388, I would be like Jesus.
Good to be here with you on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. I saw in the uh, card section, uh, it, it, like a lot of them say, you know, to the best mom in the world. I thought, man, that's a, that's a lot of different moms that are getting the same card. Like, is it a competition or something? Uh, everyone has to be the best. And I realized something. Every one of you that are mothers are the best mother for your children. My mom's right there. Hi, mom. You don't, she's not going to stand up because she just had knee surgery, but she's the best mother for me. You are the best mother for your children, and we are the best children for our mothers, and we're so happy that we can be here together. Um, we, we will stand. We are going to sing together. We're going to sing this uh, song a little faster than normal, so I hope you guys are ready. All right, a couple of you are ready because you're like the first ones to stand up. All right. Everyone else is like, okay, if we have to. All right, so we're going to get together. We're going to sing this one. It's going to be great. If you're online, like, you really got to jump up and, and sing this with us. All right. Let's, uh, let's have a little fun with this one this morning.
to get your blood pumping in the morning. Nothing but the blood of Jesus is absolutely true. We are here to worship you today, God. We are here to invite ourselves into communion with you. We know that your mercies are new every morning. And we pray that you would come be with us today.
every morning. Every morning is something new. You gather us like chicks under your wings. Your faithfulness provides for us every morning. Every morning we are yours. We worship you. We praise you, God. Open our hearts as we come before you. Open Eve's heart as he shares your word with us. We praise you, God, and we invite you to this place to change our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. No? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Right? Thank you, ladies, mothers. We... Um, we recognize those that also would be mothers, but God hasn't seen fit. We recognize you as well this morning, and, uh, and uh, God, God has you in his heart and his mind as well. But mothers, we say thank you so much for your sacrifice. I am forever grateful for my mother. I called her this morning early, even though she's in Texas, so she had to get a call from me early before I got up here to preach this morning, and I have other mothers I call as well. So hopefully you called your mothers. You guys are... <laughs> Hope you're with me this morning. Let's go. I mean, do you want me to preach? I can just go home right now. We just... Well, good morning. Mothers, mothers, good morning. I want to um, bring up one mother to you that's uh, been suffering, um, watching her son uh, go through cancer, and um, she wanted to send a note to our body. Uh, Shelly Walker, Shelly and Ed have their child at the hospital, and so they wanted to just send along their thanks. He's been doing better, and please continue uh, to pray pray for him, uh, but they send along their deepest appreciation, and thank you for the continued support, both prayers and financial. Thank you for everyone who is blessing us and encouraging us with so much love and generosity. We truly appreciate the kindness, so thank you for, for uh, being a blessing to them and continue to pray for them. But as I was saying earlier, mothers, uh, I'm so thankful for my mother. Mothers are wonderful teachers uh, because they take their time, they take their resources, and they take on the deeper responsibility of mothers motherhood and all that goes along with it. So mothers, I say happy Mother's Day and thank you for your tireless work and sacrifice. Um, today, uh, actually, let me back up a little bit. For, for preachers on Mother's Day, um, it's, it's always a, a source of consternation. It's, um, it's, we, we approach it with fear and trepidation because we don't want to say the wrong thing. You know what I'm saying? We want to say the right thing to ladies because we don't want ladies mad at us. So just know that's what we go through as preachers. We, am I going to say the wrong thing, right thing? So here's what I, I decided. I'm not going to talk necessarily about mothers today, but I'm going to talk about women and the blessing that they are. Am I doing good so far? Good. All right. What I want to talk about today is how Jesus elevated women in his, in his day, in his world. For a good portion of human history, women have been disregarded and treated poorly by men, and frankly, by other women at times as well. But Jesus was radical in his day and how he lifted up women and blessed them and valued them when the culture around them didn't so much. And so I want to look at a few different ways from the scriptures, specifically the gospels, how Jesus lifted up women in his day. Before we go further, please turn with me to Luke chapter 8. And as you do, uh, let's, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to celebrate mothers, to celebrate women. Thank you for uh, all that they do and all that they are uh, uh, in, in our lives. I just praise you and thank you. God, for my wife, um, the mother of my children, thank you for who she is, how you've blessed her and how you will bless her. Thank you for her sacrifice. And as everyone thinks about their wives and their mothers, God, I thank you um, that we have this opportunity again to say thank you to them. So may this day be a blessed day of just remembering these special people who do so much for their families. And um, we pray for those uh, that would be mothers that you haven't seen fit to make them mothers. We, we understand the, uh, the pain that that is. I pray that you would be with them in a special way today. Thank you for um, your son. And thank you for the care that you have over us, your creation, to, sh to show us in a practical way through mothers how much you care for us, how much you provide for us. So today, as we look at your word, I pray that we'll be blessed by the, 
um, the lives of women and what they do and, and how you lifted them up. Thank you for this time together. We ask your blessing and all God's people said, <clears throat> amen. At the beginning of um, Jesus's ministry, we, um, we understand he's a new teacher in town. He was called a rabbi. And there were actually hundreds of rabbis, if, if not thousands of rabbis in Jesus's day. And rabbis would start out their ministry being uh, supported by their line of work. And we know that Jesus was a, Jesus was a carpenter, and so that um, sourced his, the start of his ministry. But rabbis were traveling itinerant preachers and teachers, and they would go around and they would teach uh, people and gain disciples and, and gather disciples to themselves. Um, and they would literally go from place to place, town to town, and as uh, a rabbi and a student or a disciple would connect, uh, he would say, follow me. And so you have this very same picture of Jesus as he does this. He travels around. Uh, I want us to uh, go on a journey, though, of learning about what Christ and how Christ um, chose certain people and how it came to be. Um, but let me talk a little bit further about, about rabbis. They, as they started their ministry and traveled from place to place, they would rely on people and their hospitality in order to continue in their ministry. They would go into a house and be greeted and be welcomed. Uh, that person would take care of their, uh, their, their, their physical needs, housing and food. And, and that's what you have uh, in Jesus's day. Now, if you were a good rabbi, you were supported by prominence. People wanted to help your ministry along and they, they laid out the red carpet for you. Um, but you would have to imagine, I don't know this for a fact, but you would have to imagine that um, you didn't want the wrong people, quote unquote, supporting you in your ministry. <clears throat> but that's not the spirit that we see from Jesus straight out the gate. Luke chapter eight, verses one through three. You can look on the screen as well as we read it. Soon afterward, it says, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages. Again, this is his, the start of his ministry. He's got his disciples now. Preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women he had healed and from whom he had cast out evil spirits. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, some versions might say household manager, Susanna and many others who were doing what? Contributing their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. Now, look at the people that Jesus is associating with and spends a lot of time with. What's obvious is obviously he's with his disciple, but what may not be so obvious to us on the surface, really doesn't really stand out, is that he also had women in his company that followed him. Now, this actually, in that culture, would have been a problem uh, specifically for religious leaders like the Pharisees and the scribes and teachers of the law, and therefore others in the culture. They would kind of look down on this. Why? And it's hard to believe, but the customs of the day were that women were more spectators than they were participants in the spiritual journey, if you would. Um, <clears throat> they, in the avenues of learning and worship about the things of God, they really weren't um, active participants, but again, more so spectators. They weren't allowed to participate in the worship service uh, of synagogue. I think our closest thing to synagogue is what we have here. So Lynetta wouldn't have been on stage. Sorry, Lynetta. Um, but thank you that you are. Yes, thank you. You have a great voice, right? Give everybody, everybody give her a hand. Thank you that you can worship with us. She's like, stop talking about me. Um, but women, Megan, women were, wouldn't have been allowed on our worship service if we were in a regular synagogue back in the day, right? They, um, they weren't allowed in the Jewish temple beyond a certain part called the court of the women. That was their stoppage point. They couldn't go further than that in the temple where people wanted to worship God. And in a lot of cases, you really weren't even supposed to speak with a woman in public. Actually, even their husbands were encouraged to speak to their wives in private at home and not in public. So we don't get that on the surface. We don't understand that culture. That's not our culture, but that's the culture then. Do you remember the story of the woman at the well? Right, where Jesus meets this woman at the well and he, he communicates the gospel, reveals himself to her, which is awesome. But she was amazed and, um, and, uh, and, and amazed for two reasons. Number one, because he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. And number two, because 
She was a woman. He was a man. Why are you, why are you talking to me? This is, not, this is not normal. His disciples were even surprised when they got back because they had gone into town shopping. If you remember the story, they came back and here's what they're surprised at. John chapter four, verse 27 Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So this is the culture of the day. Religiously speaking, women were were seen as low in the culture and nothing to offer by the way of prestige. But here we get a wonderful lesson about our God is that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And Jesus partnered with those that others were not willing to partner with. He goes and he partners with women. He lets women be a part of his teachings when he's sitting and he's as the rabbi. Sometimes rabbis, would t- they wouldn't mind taking five people and teaching them, but to take women along and to teach and to, to help them learn the scriptures, that was a no-no. And yet Jesus partners with them, he allows them, and he allows them to, to, to support his ministry. I, what I find that's interesting in the list is as we work backward through the text, this list includes a woman named Susanna that we don't get much information about. It also includes a, a woman by the name of Joanna, of uh, the wife of Chusa, who was Herod's uh, business manager or household manager, or I like to say chief of staff, right? That's who this guy is. I, I never noticed that before, but can you imagine the conversations that Joanna is having with her husbands about Jesus? Like, hey, I'm going to go and support this Jesus. And I can see her husband be like, honey, you know, I work for Herod, right? Like Herod. Herod is the Herod that would later um, um, scourge Jesus, that would have him whipped and, and then send him back to Pilate. He wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle and he wouldn't do it. Jesus wouldn't do it when this is when he was about to be crucified. And so he's just like, I, I have no time for you and sends him back to Pilate. This is that same Herod who really had no love, obviously, for Jesus. So the husband is, is through his wife, supporting Jesus' ministry. That's very interesting. But what probably is the most interesting in the list is the name Mary Magdalene. She was a woman whom Jesus healed, but not only that, he healed her, her of, of seven demons. Seven demons. Now imagine that stigma all your life. Oh, you're the lady that had the demons. I think I'll just make my exit right now. I'll leave um, because they might come back and I don't want to be a part of that scene. But imagine having that stigma in your life. You are the person, oh, you're, you're that person. You're, you're crazy Mary. You're the one that, but you know what? Jesus wasn't afraid of that stigma and he took a risk on her and he let her follow him around for all of his ministry. Now think about that concept and think about the people that Jesus associates with, and we'll talk more about Mary later, but Jesus was appropriately supported by women in his ministry and thereby lifting up the place of women in his day. Number two, Jesus was appropriately worshiped by women. At least two different times, it was a woman who, get this, understood who was before her and radically but appropriately worshiped the Lord in a special way. And the special way I'm talking about is anointing, anointing. We never see men in the scriptures or in the gospels anyway, that I can recall, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, come and anoint Jesus with oil, even though it should have been something that was recognized that he is very worthy of. When someone was anointed by another in the scriptures, it generally was an acknowledgement that this person right here that I'm anointing is special. God's hand is on this person right here. In the Old Testament, prophets were anointed. Priests were anointed. Kings were anointed. Jesus was all those things and more. And yet not too many people recognize this before his resurrection, but women did. None of the disciples, male disciples did, but the women did. Look with me to Luke chapter seven, verse 36, 39. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Let me back up a little bit. This is a story 
about Jesus going into the house of a Pharisee, invited him over, um, and uh, this was traditional. Again, this goes along with his being a teacher and a rabbi. He's getting famous, and people want to know who he is, and so this Pharisee invites him over. Um, he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now, that, that point right there is important. You understand that there's not sitting at a table like we would and have... we. A lot of, lot of you are going to do today, you're going to go out to dinner or you're going to go home and you're going to sit at the table. You're going to sit in the chair. They didn't do so much that in their culture. They leaned, they were, the table was about that high and they leaned on the table so their feet are kicked out. Everyone got that picture? You with me? Nod your head if you're with me. Mm, all right, this is important. Here we go. So as they're leaning, reclining at table, behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table... Think about that for a moment. This woman is going to barge a party. When she learned he's reclining at table, I think she said to herself, this is my chance. This is my opportunity. Reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. What is she going to do? Standing behind him at his feet. Can you imagine the scene? She barges in and people are like, what is this woman doing? Standing behind his feet, weeping. Don't mess with her, she's crying. <laughs> just, whatever's gonna happen, just, she's crying. Don't, don't touch it. <laughs> and she began to wet his feet with her, te- with her tears and, and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisees who had invited him saw this and said to himself, this is, if this man were a prophet, he would, know, he would have known who is and what sort of woman is touching him for she's a sinner. Ew. That's the, ew, that would, that would be the reaction and more, disgust. Skip down to verse 44. Jesus knows his thoughts and rebukes Simon. Says, Simon, he's not even looking at Simon. You see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet but she hasn't stopped wetting my feet with her tears. It was customary if you were out and about coming into someone's house, customary to have your feet washed. This Pharisee says, no, you get that. You don't get that, Jesus. And she wiped these tears with her hair. You gave me no kiss, Simon. It was traditional in that culture to kiss someone on the cheek, right? Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss. Uh, my family, I, I'm from a Haitian background, and it was in, it's imperative when you go into a house of a relative or a friend that you kiss the ladies on the cheek. If you didn't, you get a slap on the cheek. So we went in and we kissed whoever it was. I don't care if she was wrinkly, you just went ahead and did it. <laughs> Because it was customary, it was proper. Jesus says, you didn't kiss me on the cheek, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. You didn't show me the respect and the honor and the worth that I am worth, but she can't stop doing it. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? You don't know who you are. She knows. <laughs> they don't know. Who is this that forgives sins? And that's why they don't anoint him. That's why they don't treat him special. He said to this woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We learn a wonderful lesson about God here. God lifts up those that others would put down because again, God sees the heart. God knows the heart. And one that repents and one that says, Jesus, you are worthy. I don't care. I will be embarrassed for you. She makes a plan. She knows he's going to be there. She's like, this is my chance. This is my one chance to show my God how much I care, how much I love, how much I am so repentant of what I've done. I will go. I will embarrass myself. I will let my hair down, which was akin to going topless in that culture. This is how embarrassing this was. 
that she would let her hair down in front of all these men and weep over the feet of Jesus, not caring what would happen. Her heart was repentant and she recognized Jesus for who he was, worthy of worship, worthy of being embarrassed for, worthy of being talked about poorly about, worthy of being shamed further than she already, already was. We can learn a lot from this woman, can't we? And Jesus lifts her up and calls the Pharisee on the carpet. Those who love little, those who have little to be forgiven or are, 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 live, love little. And those who have much to be given for love much. This woman appropriately worshiped Jesus because he was worthy of anything that she could offer. And lastly, Jesus appropriately, uh, was appropriately, appropriately sought after by women. Jesus was appropriately sought after by women. The next one we'll read is, um, is one of my favorite passages of scripture because it gives us a fantastic part of the resurrection story and how Christ reveals himself to his disciples. So go with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses one through 18. It's the account, um, I'll give you a little background. Jesus had uh, died on the cross and, and rose again and and the ladies, the night before or the day before was the Sabbath, and so they didn't have time to embalm him. And so they wanted to go back to the tomb to properly embalm Christ. And they're thinking on the way, how, do we go, how are we going to roll back the stone? Like, who's going to do that for us? Now, let me say that there are different uh, details in different passages of Scripture. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all share some different details about the resurrection. And some will look at that and say that, that well, there's contradiction. There's not. There's just different details from different perspectives. Understand that? Like, for instance, I'm looking out at you in the room right now, and I can see the whole room. Someone in the front here, they may maybe not see that someone is here in church in the back. Now, what if the person in the front said, well, I saw this person in church, and I said, well, I saw these people in church. Then those things didn't necessarily match up. Well, they do. If I, if I, only, if I said, I only see this person or I only see that person, that would be a contradiction. And that's not what you have in the gospel accounts. You have people sharing their details from their perspective. You with me? Nod your head if you're with me. I know that was really fast. You can go back and watch the video later, okay? So you have these different perspectives and John gives us his perspective, his account of the story, and here's the account that he gives. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, came to the tomb early. And while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, who's John, and they were going toward the uh, the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's why some would say, well, John is younger than Peter, and that's why he outran him to the, to the tomb. Verse five, and stooping to look in, John, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, out of breath, and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Like Jesus was saying, you know what? I don't need this anymore. Let me make sure that you guys know no robbers came in here and stole my body. I took the time to fold this and set it aside. Thank you very much. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. And yet as, and for as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead Then the disciples went back to their homes. Stopping there for a moment, um, Mike, I have a cousin at one time, knowing that I was going to be a minister, going into ministry, and he was not a believer himself. He um, was a scoffer, best way I can describe it. He questioned me on these texts. He's like, don't you see this contradiction over here? It says that there was Mary and Joanna and Salome that went to the tomb, and here it just says Mary went. So again, that's not a contradiction. If you understand what's going on, then the different details that are shared in the different times and different perspectives, it works. Again, I don't have to have time to go through all that again, but everything checks out. The answer is that simply the different accounts share different details from different perspectives, but there are no contradictions. Now, what's ironic and more interesting is what happens 
Next in the passage, I say ironic because if my cousin really wanted to pick on something, he would pick on this, what Jesus would do next. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Um, So she sees two angels and doesn't freak out. Is that a question that you're all thinking, right? (laughs) Now, here's where the details from other passages of Scripture help. Uh, Another passage of Scripture says that she saw two men. And what I think happened here is John after the fact, knows they were angels and says she saw two angels. At the time, though, they're dressed in white, but they just seem like men. They didn't have the angel vibe going off (laughs) at the time. And I think that is true. As we look further on in the passage, we'll see that she most likely thinks they're just random people that work there at the garden. So look at verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Almost what she's saying is not, it's not making sense. Like she's, she's just saying this stuff. She's like, I, she's so distraught. Her Lord is gone. Her dead Lord is gone. Dead in her mind because that's all she knows. And yet she's not satisfied with leaving. This is not right. The tomb is open. Where is my Lord? God, if you have him, just give him to me. And I'll take him away. I'm seeking my dead Lord. Where is he? She won't give up. Sir, if you carried him, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She said, she turned and said to him in Aramaic. I I think that's there because maybe she said it in different language. Bible's written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Maybe she was talking Greek. I don't know for specifically, but maybe she said it in Greek. (laughs) And then when she hears his, his voice, This person that she's followed through for for three years of her life who taught her when no one else would teach her. You remember that? No one else would most likely teach her. She would learn from this rabbi. And then when he said her name, that's when she remembered who was talking to her. And she says, Rabbi, which means teacher. What a beautiful, a beautiful scene. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Other versions say, don't touch me. Really cling is the better word because... Jesus was saying, stop holding on to me. I haven't ascended to my father yet. I'm not staying. But go to my brothers and say to them, I I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. What is fascinating about this? Is that of all the people that Jesus could have appeared to first, of all the disciples and men that he would entrust to spreading the gospel throughout the whole world, the very first person that Jesus reveals himself to after his death and resurrection is the crazy ex-demon lady, Mary Magdalene. That's who. You know what's also interesting about women in that day? They weren't trusted to give a report in court. You wouldn't trust a woman for, for a testimony. That was the culture. And so if my cousin really wanted an issue to pick out, a pick on as far as the gospel here, it would be, what? He went to a woman? That just doesn't make any sense if he understood the culture. You don't go to, if you want a woman to stand up for you in court, that's just a bad idea. No, you want a reliable source. You want a man to do it. That's the culture that they lived in, but not Jesus. <laughs> Not, not Jesus. Mary's exactly the person he wanted to tell his disciples. She, because she wasn't satisfied to go home and wonder, just wonder what happened. She had to know. And I think Jesus honored this woman because she had to know what happened. She couldn't stop looking for Jesus. We can learn a lot from this woman, right? 
This is a beautiful picture of what God does for the person that won't stop looking for him. Hebrews chapter 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him, that chase after him, that aren't satisfied with just going home and wondering. They need to stay and find Jesus. This is what Mary does here. If you seek Jesus with all your heart, you will find Jesus. And when you find him, he will accept you and won't turn you away. We've, we've learned a few things from women in our text today. Number one, they supported Jesus' ministry. Number two, they appropriately worshiped him, gave him worship that men did not. And they sought after Jesus wholeheartedly. We can learn a lot from these ladies in the text this morning. Worship team, would you come? Um, as we get ready for communion, I think about the fact that Jesus chose 12 disciples, but they weren't the only disciples that he chose. But these 12, this last supper, he brought together men very, very different from one another, very different backgrounds, probably didn't like each other. You had some zealots. You had some you know, people that really supported the government. You had others that did not. He brought these people together. And not only that, Jesus brought women along in his ministry. Jesus did things very, very different than a lot of people. But these people, Jesus was able to get them to come together at a table of communion and plant seeds of what would be the greatest revolution of all time, a revolution against the power of sin, against the power of death. And Jesus was no respecter of persons. Women were a part of this picture, a massive part of the gospel. I can't help but think about Mary, Lazarus's sister, and she anointed Jesus as well. And Jesus rebukes the disciples because they were getting after her. Why? Why wasn't this ointment that you just wasted, why wasn't this perfume sold and given to the poor? Then Jesus says, leave her alone. She's done this to honor me. You don't get it, but she does. She's done this to honor me. If a person's heart pleases the Lord, they were a part of his life and ministry. And Jesus uplifted women. He didn't cast them aside like the culture did. One thing that they all had in common was a repentant heart, a heart that said, God, I see my own way. I see my way and I choose your way instead. And if they had a repentant heart, he welcomed them and received them. And God welcomes you and receives you, welcomes us and receives us as well. We take this communion and you can go ahead and prepare yourself for it now. You open up the top there. And it's just a reminder, because honestly, I mean, we could do a lot better than styrofoam. <laughs> but it's just a reminder of what Christ has done for us. In 1 Corinthians, we have this. Paul says, for I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord Himself. Remember, Paul wasn't with the original 12, so Jesus had to teach him this communion. One night, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in pieces and said, this is my, say it, body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. body, the bread, the styrofoam represents his body, broken for us, given for us, the perfect lamb of God. The word of God says, life is in the blood. And Jesus gives us his blood to partake. This grape juice just reminds us of what Christ has done. The Lord also taught Paul what he meant by the blood. He says, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this 
in remembrance of me as often as you drink. And so we remember what the Lord has done for us. Would you pray with me, Father in heaven? Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. Ultimately, God, thank you for your sacrifice that you have brought us together, all peoples, men, women, black, white, all races. Someday, God, we will not have a remote service, but we'll have a in-person communion with you. And we look forward to that day. So until that day, we proclaim your death and resurrection until you return. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. And Stan, let's, uh, let's sing our way out of here today. Lord, I come and I confess Bowing here I find my rest Without you
Happy Mother's Day.